Hello and welcome everyone. For those who celebrate Thanksgiving, hope you all had a great Thanksgiving break. Today is the sixth session of our Devan and Beyond series, with just one more to go in December before we start our 2023 series next year. For those who are new to Devan and Beyond, this program takes you through a series of topics and activities related to building out on Oracle Cloud. These events are hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for customers and end users. You can create a free account to join in discussions, post questions, and we'll look for upcoming events on various topics. My name is Renu Bhatt. I'm a TPM with the Customer Enablement team. And today I'm joined by Olivia Ferda and Joey Hall, both cloud engineers here at Oracle. And I'm really thankful to our content experts, Sunil Jain, Len, Len Lois, uh, who will be helping us with the questions that you will be posting in the Q&A panel down below. So please do not use the chat window to post your questions. Use the Q&A panel, because there you can look at the other questions also that others have posted. So with that, um, one more reminder that this session will be recorded. And if once uh, the session is over, you will get an email with the recording link. Feel free to share that with your colleagues, those who missed it. And with that, I will hand it over to Joey. Thank you for the introduction, Renu. Like she mentioned, my name is Joey Hall, and I am a staff cloud engineer here at Oracle on the customer enablement team. Been happy to lead you through a lot of these different day one and beyond sessions and looking forward to our database quick start that we have today. So I'll be leading through the first half of the presentation, first section, and then I'll be handing over to Olivia for some of the additional portion. Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia Ferda. I'm an associate cloud engineer on the customer enablement team, and I look forward to today's database quick start. And as stated earlier, I am going to be a panelist. My name is Sunil Jain, and I'm looking forward to talking about databases with everyone. Thank you. Len Lewis, Senior Cloud Architect, and looking forward to working with you and ask, answering your questions. Thanks, everybody. And as mentioned, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to add those into the Q&A section of Zoom. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to go through a slide portion. So we'll be going through the different Oracle Cloud database services, some use cases for those, when and why you would use them. We'll spend some time in the demo. So we'll get into the console. Olivia will be walking us through that at the end. And we will be doing Q&A throughout. But if we don't get to your questions during the presentation live or within chat, we'll try to save some time at the end to answer those questions there. So here, what's the purpose of today's session? So the purpose of today's session is really to give you an understanding of the different Oracle database offerings within OCI, help you understand the key features for those different database offerings and the use cases for each of them. So by the end, you that are watching the webinar now will have a general understanding of when and why you would use each of these services. So for each type of database deployment, you're going to have a different level of manageability, meaning as you move from left to right on the slide here, you will have more of the management being handled by Oracle. So you'll have a bit of a trade off here with customization, but overall, the more managed services are aimed at doing a lot of the legwork for you and providing you with the tools to better understand and operate your database workloads. So you have your more customer managed services on the left here, such as Oracle database running on compute. You will have the ability to use single node database systems on either bare metal or virtual machine instances and two node rack database systems on virtual machines as well. And with these, these are your more customer managed services, but you'll have a lot of the tools like the console, the API, different command lines, either within the OCI command line or database command line. You'll have a lot of those different tools that you could still work with your database systems and do a lot of those management management capabilities that you will currently be used to. And with these, you'll still have access to tools like DataGuard and AutoTDE for encryption. So that will be there as well. Your semi-managed services here in the middle being uh, Oracle Database Cloud Service and Exadata. And here, your teams are going to have access to all of the different features needed to build those dynamic business applications. And we'll really try to increase your productivity with different self-service self -service database provisioning, lifecycle automation, really just making it easier for your administrators to do things like create, patch, and manage your Oracle databases. Then lastly, 
at the far right here, you can see our more fully managed database services. So that's going to be ATP and ADW, the autonomous database offerings. And these are really going to eliminate a lot of the complexity of operating and securing your databases while still giving you really high levels of performance, scalability, and availability. Just to quickly go over this, we'll dive into this more in Olivia's section of the presentation, but ADW is going to be the column optimized version of the database. So going to be usually used for your more analytics heavy workloads and ATP is the row optimized version. So it's usually going to be used for your more transactional workloads. And you'll have a lot of integrated tools with these as well. So you'll have machine learning notebooks, SQL developer, and Apex that all provide you with additional functionality as well integrated with the autonomous database. So let's start off by talking about <clears throat> DBCS or the Oracle Database Cloud Service. And the Oracle Database Cloud Service is going to provide you the ability to deploy the fully featured Oracle Cloud Databases all within the cloud. And you'll have a couple different deployment options. So you'll have the ability to do the enterprise edition or the standard edition of DBCS. And I think the current database versions here are 12C, 19C, and 21C. If you currently have an Oracle database license, you can choose to bring your own license as a BYL license option as well. So that can save you a good amount of cost on your rate there. And since this is a converged database engine, it can be used for pretty much any data workload and can be deployed on either a single instance or a two node rack virtual machine database system. And this is, as we talked about in that overview slide at the beginning, this is considered more of a semi-managed service. So you, the customer, will have control over a lot of the management tasks, such as provisioning, patching, backup, disaster recovery. But you will be able to use a lot of the cloud automation tools, such as within the OCI console, the command line, or the API to assist with a lot of these tasks. And for every Oracle database, you will be able to utilize or create what you kind of see on the image here on the right. You can leverage a converged architecture, have a database that's tailored to maybe more transaction processing or data warehousing workloads. You can automate a lot of your operations and integrate with other systems. But with each of the services, it will really just depend on how much you want to have be available to you already outside of the box, right out of the box. And for the database cloud service, you can have that single database for all your data. You'll have those simple administration and visibility uh, within the console or through the command line. And you can leverage a highly available architecture with enterprise security features in the cloud and build out these integrations to work with other systems. And now I'm going to hand it over to Olivia to talk more about our fully managed database services. Thanks, Joey. All right, so in this section, I'll be talking a little bit more about the autonomous database, um, what it is, some key features or use cases for it, because this is actually where I'll be focusing today when I jump into the console for the demo portion. All right, so going into what is um, the Oracle autonomous database. So it's just a converged database that runs different workloads. So like transactional or analytic workloads. And so going back to what Joey mentioned, a converged database. So a converged database is gonna be multi-model, multi-workload and multi-tenant. So it supports any workload. So multi-model is gonna mean where you have one engine, but many APIs. So you can use the Oracle database as a document database doing simple puts and gets with JSON or as a relational database for transaction processing. So that's multi-model, you also have multi-workload and that just means one engine, many different configurations. So maybe you've got an IoT application and you need super fast writes, or maybe you have an analytical application and you need super fast analytical queries. You can use a multi-workload. And lastly, um, you also have multi-tenant and that means containerization and orchestration for your databases. So it's a way of providing isolation and scale out and consistency across ten databases, so whether relational, document graph, or spatial. So it's the best match for more of um, cloud native and data center um, native applications. 
Another thing about autonomous is you can query across multiple data types. So you have no silos across relational, JSON, graph, spatial, all of that. And so going into the different um, workloads. And so I'll actually touch a little bit more on this when I jump into the console. But as mentioned on the previous slide, there is one autonomous database for all your different workloads. So whether it's um, ADW or autonomous data warehouse, autonomous transaction processing, JSON, or even Apex for application development, you have many different options. And you'll see on the right-hand side, you have some tools that go along with um, the autonomous that we'll explore once again more when I jump into the console. All right, and you also have different deployment choices. So the first one is the shared infrastructure that you see on the top right hand of the slide. Um, so this deployment option gives you the benefits of full isolation of data and system resources while also sharing infrastructure with other customers. So this is gonna be the simplest experience for non-technical users. This is where Oracle automates and manages everything where you just, basically you just use the database resources like compute storage and region. So that's your shared infrastructure. And you also see in the console as well that this is one of the things they have to specify whether you're doing shared or dedicated. Um, then going to dedicated, this is where you have your own dedicated XDA infrastructure in the Oracle Cloud. So effectively giving you a private database cloud within the Oracle Public Cloud. And Oracle Autonomous Database on um, dedicated infrastructure runs inside a hardware enforced virtual cloud network. So it provides your own, you know, once again, database cloud running on dedicated X data infrastructure it gives you that high, highest isolation, but you have more of control of provisioning updates, um, availability and density. So those are your, your different um, deployment choices. All right, so Sunil or Link, can you talk a little bit more about why you'd use autonomous? Because there's many different use cases. Could you give a few examples? Well, I always think of autonomous as a way to, especially if I'm not starting with autonomous uh, from the very beginning, is a way of looking at new versions of the database or doing development systems. You can spin up one quickly and not worry about the specifics or go through all the trouble of getting the database and manage it like yourself. You can move in some small amounts of data and then you can test your application against the, hopefully it's representative data for your application so that you can get a feel for it against different versions uh, that are coming up, maybe look ahead in those respects and then terminate it, be done and go away. So I think that's one of the first ways I would play with it if I hadn't played with it before. The other thing is to uh, use it as a source for analytics. In particular, you can set up a data lake, smaller or a, you know even a data warehouse, autonomous data warehouse, in such a way that then you can work with analytics, experiment with machine learning, those types of things. That would be my the first way I would try it if I had not if I already had existing Oracle databases either on site or in the cloud. I would take a look at how the opportunity to develop because you can turn it off, turn it off, on. And another use case for autonomous too is if you're looking more at Apex or low code application development platform for more of you know data driven applications, um, autonomous will be great for that. So that was the autonomous Database. Um, so now jumping into data guard. Before I do that, um, Snow or Link, could you kind of give a use case for data guard, kind of set the stage and how this works with autonomous? Um, what were the advantages of this? Yeah, sure. So autonomous data guard differs from standard data guard in that it can be enabled during the provisioning of the autonomous database. And so what that usually means is when you enable data guard, you're going to have to go in, you're going to have to create a standby database, and you're going to have to create a connection from that standby database to the primary database. But with autonomous, during the provisioning of autonomous data guard in the console UI, 
you can have it set up so that the moment the autonomous database is provisioned, a connection is built to a standby database for data guard configured in maximum protection mode. So that is the differentiator of autonomous data guard versus standard data guard. Mm -hmm. And you'll see in the console too that you can enable um, data guard for your autonomous um, instance. So you'll see that as well. But going a little deeper into <laughs> data guard. So data guard just lets us set up a standby site in the case of a disaster at the primary site. Um, so during normal operations, data guard replicates transactions from the primary to the standby site, keeping both databases exactly in sync. And I just want to note that the standby site is only used under two circumstances. So first, it regularly ingests the transactions being sent over. And secondly, it only takes on workloads when the primary site fails. And this is known as active passive configuration. So in the event of a disaster at the primary site, DataGuard automates the process of switching over all the users to the secondary site and taking over all of the workload. So it can also be configured to support zero or near zero data loss and can be used for things like migrations and upgrades. All right, so I just kind of want to build on the capabilities of data guard that we just looked at. So during regular operations, active data guard allows us to open up the standby site to take on workloads such as reporting and analytics, backups, and occasional write workloads as well. So all of these workloads could or would otherwise be consuming you know, resources on our primary production site. Um, and then also during regular operations, Active Data Guard not only checks the transactions for corruptions, but it also, also will automatically repair them. So during a disaster event at the primary site, Active Data Guard behaves the same way that we saw with Data Guard. The users are gonna be redirected to the standby state automatically, never seeing an outage. All right, so the next portion that we will be jumping, jumping into is the Exadata Cloud Service or XSCS. And just you know, going into Exadata, some features. Um, so really just uh, Exadata allows you to run any Oracle database workload with that scalability, availability, and security on compat compatible cloud and on-prem infrastructure. And just some features of Exadata. So more on the left hand side is more of the software features that you're going to see with Exadata. And on the right side is more of the hardware features that you're going to see as part of Exadata. And some features include persistent memory, SQL query, query offload, um, analytics, machine learning, and you know, mixed workloads running in consolidated environments. On the right hand side, you'll also see PMIP, and this is database transparent persistent memory. Um, and this just reduces things like SQL. Um, read latencies. Um, so Lynn or Snow, would you like to highlight any of these features on um, for Exadata? Well, the, the key thing is to recognize that the hardware imp implications or the hardware additions that Sun have provided us in this solution in the Exadata platform are all on the right hand side. And then what Oracle has done with the database to take advantage of that of that hardware is on the left hand side. So that's for when you review these PDFs, and then you can you can Google any of the respective terms that are you're unfamiliar with. But at the what this is really all about is taking a balance between what is physically available uh, in the system today, and then having the software take advantage of those bits. Just as an example, the new device driver for 100 gigabits per second, which connects our, if you will, pizza boxes with our NAS systems internally now gives us the level of, makes it look like read and write directly into your DDR uh, for memory. So you really get very fast connection that allows you to ex exceed the size of the memory in any individual box and therefore gives you more ability to do uh, in memory database whether it be your sql calls or 
any other aspect that requires an understanding of what's going on, uh, what you want to do with the with the database. So it's it's just about taking advantage of the hardware, and that we've worked hard to do that for you. That's all. Definitely many different um, features to explore with Exadata, and also here are just some of the um, deployment models. So whether it's on-prem, hybrid cloud, or public cloud, you have different options here. And then you also see more of um, software highlights around OLTP analytics and consolidation. Like, do you want to talk a little bit more about the software highlights or some things to keep in mind with Exadata? Sorry, Olivia, I didn't hear that. If that was addressed to me, I'm looking at the questions to answer here. <laughs> no worries. I was just asking about some software highlights to be aware of or just you know key things to point out for um xas software highlights yeah so i guess like uh, while lynn's answering the questions i can talk a little bit so a lot of the advantages you'll see on exadata come from a lot of the optimizations that come built in and so this is kind of highlighting some of those with you know the rdma algorithms for scaling out and the smart caching system, which is going to have both disk and flash memory. And the database by default is going to run operation in parallel to sort of understand which ones are going to be faster. And it will know how to route the right jobs to the right set of memory for accelerating your database IO. So those are the sort of things and optimizations that Exadata is going to be using to give you the faster performance. Thanks, Anil. All right, and then also we saw disaster recovery or act or data guard with autonomous. You, you also do have disaster recovery with active data guard for Exadata. So you have that cloud automation to instantiate standby, failure switch over and reinstate. And that standby supports symmetric or asymmetric configurations and can reside across availability, availability domains and regions. So it provides that asynchronous replication for max performance and also supports manual setup for automatic failover. And then, so that was XSCS. Um, so now going into XSA Cloud at Customer or XSCC. So XSCC is one of the database services offered on OCI. So with um, XSCC, you can maintain absolute control of your data while leveraging the combined capabilities of Oracle Exadata and OCI managed by Oracle. So you get really just the combined capabilities of once again, Oracle Exadata and OCI inside your own um, data center. And then going into autonomous and XSCC. So Oracle offers both autonomous and co-managed Oracle database cloud solutions. So autonomous on XSCC combines the benefits of that self-driving, self-securing and self-repairing database management system and the security and control offered by having it deployed securely on-prem behind your firewall. And then with that, I will pass it over to Joey, who will be covering the next portion, which is Golden Gate. Thank you, team. So now that we've talked about some of our different Oracle Cloud database options, I want to spend a little bit of time discussing a tool that you can leverage with really any of these data systems, which is Golden Gate. And Golden Gate is a tool that you can use to really replicate data between a, a wide variety of source and destination systems that you see on the screen here. It's going to be a managed service that's so going to provide a real-time data mesh platform, which can use replication to keep your data highly available and can enable you to do real-time analysis. And with this, you can really design, execute, and monitor your data replication and stream data processing solutions without the need to allocate or manage any of those compute environments. So again, taking away more of the management tasks to make this process a bit easier. And Golden Gate's gonna include a graphical user interface. It'll give you some end-to-end -end monitoring, automatic scaling. 
the ability to do inline transformations and an extensive number of APIs that you can use to customize your experience. So really replicating, integrating data across a wide variety of source systems into these destination systems that you can see here. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, just to give you an idea for how it looks. And there are really a lot of use cases for Golden Gate, but I'm just going to highlight a few of the major ones here for you to get a general idea of the tool and how it can be used. The first being replicating data from on-premise to cloud. So data from your on-premise systems can be used within OCI for analytics, across other applications, or even for disaster recovery from on-premise to cloud as well. You can use Golden Gate to replicate data across regions in real time for your multi-region deployments. So region to region replication can be utilized with Golden Gate. Maybe you are utilizing some SaaS applications and would like that data to be moved into OCI for use within your different OCI tooling as well. And then multi-cloud deployments are becoming more and more common and data needs to be able to move quickly and securely between systems. So Golden Gate can be used with a variety of other cloud vendors, other cloud systems outside of Oracle, and we can provide documentation in the chat to give you that more uh, extensive list as well to work with those multi-cloud deployments. And the last piece I would like to talk about here is going to be MySQL database service and some of the tools that go along with it before we hop into the console. And the MySQL database service is also a fully managed Oracle Cloud infrastructure service. It's a native service that is developed, managed, and supported by the MySQL team at Oracle. And going with the theme of today, with this, Oracle automates a lot of the tasks like your backup and recovery, and database um, and operating system patching, and you're responsible for just managing your data, schema designs, and the access policies for it. So you can, as you can see on the screen here, you can easily create a highly available database system. So within the console, just a single click, and then that will be a three node database system using MySQL group replication to automate failover with a recovery time of about minutes and zero data loss. And it takes advantage of OCI's multiple availability domain and fault domain architecture to help deliver this high availability. So just to quickly note, <clears throat> multi-AD regions or multi-availability domain regions will provide multiple data centers located within an OCI region. And those are going, the availability domains are going to be isolated from each other and are going to be fault tournament, fault tolerant. So this service uses this architecture to help deliver that fast automatic failover that we just mentioned previously with that RTO of minutes and zero data loss here. So utilizing the OCI architecture in terms of regions, availability domains, and fault domains. If you're part of our technical quick start, we cover this in a little bit more detail, but this is just how the MySQL database service can leverage that within here. And then Heatwave is a part of the MySQL service that provides a single solution for running your hybrid OLTP and OLAP workloads. So it will eliminate the need for having a separate analytics database, separate machine learning tools, and extract, transform, and load and TL duplication. So no changes to your existing applications are necessary and it will enable, enable you to run both the OLTP and real-time analytics workloads simultaneously, simultaneously within a single database platform. So it can utilize the Heatwave Query Accelerator to really drastically increase your workload performance for these mixed workload types. I don't know, Lynn, if you want to talk about any other use cases or things to keep in mind with MySQL Heatwave before we hop into the console? Given the time, I just go in the console. Sounds good to me. So in summary, from this lecture portion, we gave an introduction to the different types of Oracle database offerings. We talked about features for them, use cases, when and where you use one offering over the other. And now we're going to get into the console tour to get started with using some of our Oracle database services. So I will hand this back over to Olivia. Thanks, Joey. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. 
All right, so actually, before I jump into the console, I actually want to showcase Live Labs because we did cover a ton of different um, database offerings today. And if you want to get more hands on experience with an OCI or even with some of the tools that we covered today, Live Labs is a great way to do so. So here is the home page of Live Labs. And if I want to filter on something like role, so in this case, maybe DBA, since we're covering um, database offerings today. So I'm going to click on that. And you'll see all these different workshops pop up and you can filter on these different workshops from intermediate, beginner, advanced, all these different levels. Um, you'll see that there's different ways that you can run these workshops depending on the workshop that you launch. Um, there's other different fields as well. So in this case, we're filtering on role, but you can get as granular as the product. So if you're just wanting to focus on the autonomous data warehouse, you can go ahead and do so. But here are the labs that popped up. And you'll see that they will give you a time estimate. So some will say like an hour, some will say 15 minutes. So we do have shorter ones called sprints, which usually range from two to 15 minutes. We have longer workshops as well. Um, that could be an hour to a few hours. And you'll see that, you know, you can learn about how to protect your, your data with Oracle Active Data Guard. Um, so let me just click into one since we're focusing on autonomous today. So you'll see that there is an autonomous database 15 minute quick start. So I'm going to click into that right here. And so whenever you click into one of these labs, you'll usually see a video <laughs> introduction. You'll see an outline for what this lab will cover, as well as any prereqs that you may need before beginning this lab. And just to launch this, so for this workshop, and I think usually for most of these workshops, it'll use, usually say run in your own tenancy or I'll say run on Live Lab Sandbox. So you can choose one of these options. So even if I click on run on your own tenancy, you don't necessarily have to follow along. If you just kind of want to see how something works, you can glance through these um, labs. They usually give you an introduction or more information. And if I skip just to lab two for creating um, tables and load data, let's just say I just want to focus on this specifically, you'll see that there's different tasks and it'll kind of give you the steps and give you the pictures for how to do it. So, yeah, I just want to show this real quick because once again, you know, we did cover a lot of different services today and you can get more hands on experience with most of what we covered today through these live labs. All right, so now jumping into the OCI console. All right, so here is the home page right here and just going to this hamburger menu right here. Um, so you'll see that there's databases and this is where that MySQL that Joey covered is going to be located. So if you want to explore that more, that is going to be <laughs> under databases. We also do have Oracle database, and this is where most of the services that we cover today are going to be located. So autonomous, you're going to see XSCC, Exadata, all that stuff right here, Golden Gate. So you'll see most of these different services covered here. And if you even want more information on related services, you'll see some links right here to explore or even just help for these different services if you want to get more documentation. Um, so I'm mainly going to be focusing on the autonomous database today. So I'm going to click into that. So I already have autonomous database instance created, but actually kind of want to walk you through how you create it because there's some key elements to that. And just a quick recap, an autonomous database is really just a cloud database that uses a machine learning to automate things like database tuning, security, backups, updates, and other routine management tasks. So whenever you're creating your autonomous database instance, you have to specify the compartment or where you want to create it. Give it a name, um, give it a database name, all this information right here. And here's actually where I really want to focus because I think there's a few questions over this. But you can um, choose your workload type. So depending on what workload um, you're looking for, you can do data warehouse. Or if you're more focused on low code application development, maybe you might want to choose Apex. This is where you specify just going back to the slide deck. You have many different workload types to choose from. And here's where you choose your deployment type. So you can decide where, whether you want this to run on shared or dedicated X data infrastructure. So you can choose shared or you can choose dedicated for the highest isolation. So just depending on what deployment type you're looking for, you can specify that here. Um, you can also start with always free. And so if I enable this, just note that you'll be um, limited in terms of OCPU and storage auto scaling. 
But if you do start with always free, you'll see in the console um, that you can always upgrade to paid. So you can start with always free if you want. We just be um, limited in terms of auto scaling. Uh, some other things that you'll have to go ahead, <clears throat> go ahead and create are things, <laughs> things like your admin credentials. So you'll see in order to access some of the tools associated with autonomous or other things, you're going to need to have this right here, but you can always change this later on. And just a few other things that you might need to specify is choosing your network access or choosing your license type. So whether that's license included or bring your own license. And then optionally, you can just provide contacts for any, you know, operational notifications or announcements or anything. So you can add that. But really just want to focus here, choosing your workload type and choosing your deployment type. So once you've specified all of that um, and you've created your autonomous database instance, you can go ahead and click into it. And so this is what it's going to look like. So you'll see all your general information for your autonomous database instance. So you'll see the workload type. So this is data warehouse. Um, I see all this different information right here. You'll even see your Apex instance. You can access that here if you want to, once again, do more low code application development. Um, you'll see your infrastructure types. This is not dedicated infrastructure. And then just going back to what Sonola was talking about earlier with autonomous data guard, you can go ahead and enable this. So currently it's disabled, but you can enable that. But since I'm on always free, it's not supported right now. And you'll see some other information around backup, all that information right here. And actually just scrolling down. Um, so you'll see different metrics right here around CPU utilization, storage utilization. So you can get more insights on your autonomous database instance here through these different metrics. And so another thing that I want to highlight is backup. So autonomous database automatically backs up your database for you. And the retention period for backups is going to be 60 days. So you can restore and recover your database to any point in time during this retention period. Um, the autonomous database also performs a full backup every 60 days. Um, it's going to perform weekly, cumulative, and daily incremental backups. So you'll kind of see that right here. So yeah, so this is where your backups are going to be located. And then um, just a few more key actions right here. Um, so you can stop your autonomous database um, instance, restart, restore, create clone. Going back to earlier when we're creating this instance, we set up an admin password so you can kind of manage more of that here. Um, you can rename your database. And then also I did always free, but I can always upgrade instance to paid so I can get more features like that autonomous um, data guard and also you know around OCPU and storage auto scaling. And then you can even terminate your um, autonomous database, but here are a lot of the key actions that you'll need. And then I just want to point out database connection. Um, so let's say you want to connect your autonomous database to um, Oracle Analytics Cloud or OAC. You're going to need to download your client credentials or your wallet. And so you'll see that there's two different wallet types right here. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see that there's an instance wallet. And this is what Oracle recommends using because you can end users and you can use it for application use whenever possible. So this is going to be more of a database specific wallet. So Oracle recommends this instance wallet here. Um, you also do have a regional wallet and regional wallet should only be used for admin purposes that you know require potential access to all autonomous databases within a region. So you do have these two options, but if you want more of a database specific wallet, you want to use this instance wallet here. And then, um, so yeah, I'm gonna click into database actions and I actually already have this pulled up right here. Um, so this is just gonna provide you <clears throat> different development tools that you'll see right here, um, different data tools, um, administration and monitoring features for <clears throat> autonomous database. So you see all this different um, tools that you can leverage. And just some things to note about um, database actions is that it runs on Oracle REST data services and access is going to be provided through schema based authentication. So in order to use database actions, you must sign in as a database user whose schema is enabled for database actions. So by default, the admin user is going to be enabled to access database actions. So you'll see that right here. 
I'm admin, so by default, I can access database actions. Otherwise, I must be signed in as a database user whose schema is enabled for database actions. All right, so I just going to explore some of these different development tools right here. So the first being um, SQL Developer. So I've already launched that. Oops, so it's right here. So yeah, so I've already launched SQL Developer um, Web right here. And usually when you first launch, it'll kind of give you a tour and walk you through all the different components. But really, it's just a web interface for working with your Oracle database. So you can run queries. You can create tables, generate schema diagrams, and more. And here's just a sample worksheet right here. So I can run this query right here to describe the schema. And you'll see your, your script output um, generated right here. And you'll see that there's other sample queries as well um, that you can run or explore. Um, you can also go ahead and create a user. And creating a user is just a way to create a schema. So in this section, you can execute the create user statement to create and configure a database user. And you can also grant different permissions to your user, like creating a table or selecting any table. So you can grant these different permissions here. Um, you can also go ahead and revoke access. So you can execute the revoke statement to revoke user and role system privileges. And then in order to do so, you must be assigned the privilege with the admin option. But I just want to showcase SQL Developer Web as a tool that you can use. And you can run all these different queries right here, as well as you know creating your user and revoking um, access. All right, so that was SQL Developer Web. Um, you'll see that there's other different development tools. Um, just once again, I want to highlight Apex. So this is more of the low-code application development tool for more of data-driven applications. So it's pretty user-friendly. So that means that non-IT professionals can use it to build an application and it makes it easier to build an app in days um, or weeks, not months or years. So that's something you can explore if you're interested in application development. Last tool that I want to point out as part of the development portion is Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks or OML um, Notebooks. So I actually have this pulled up right here. So once you've launched it, um, the page will look like that. And OML Notebooks is an Apache Zeppelin based cloud interface that supports things like notebook creation, scheduled runs, and versioning. So you can document your work using Markdown. You can run SQL and Python code for things like data exploration, visualization, and machine le learning model building. So all those different use cases. And once again, it allows for that collaboration among you know, data scientists, database admins, and IT professionals, all your different groups. Um, and then if you're just getting started with OML, you'll see that there's different documentation. So you can click into that and it'll kind of walk you through the steps of getting started and give you that documentation. So how to use AutoML, how to deploy models, uh, managing permissions. So you'll see all that stuff right here. And then here are the, actually the quick actions that you can go ahead um, and do to get started. All right, so yeah, that is the Autonomous Database Console Tour. Once again, um, you can leverage Live Labs to get more hands-on experience. So you can do more of these shorter sprints, like 15 minutes, or you can do some of the longer um, workshops as well to get more hands-on experience in Autonomous or even just some of the other tools that we covered today. And so before we look at Q&A, Lynn or Sunil, did you have anything that you wanted to, to add? Um, I think you've done a very good job. There was a question earlier on um, how to see some of the different database offerings in the in the console. And so maybe just how you would see um, your databases and something like that would be nice. But other than that, I think, um, great job. And once again, in the console, <laughs> You'll see a lot of the different database offerings that we covered right here under Oracle Database. And then you'll see more of MySQL that Joey covered right here. And then if I just go to Oracle Database overview right here, you'll get a little bit more of a um, idea of your different databases right here. Um, but yeah, this is where you're gonna find a lot of your different um, database services that we covered today. 
The question actually was a little more specific. It wanted to know if um, there was a, a way to see what was in the particular tenancy. In other words, what the uh, contract showed that the particular customer had in this circumstance. There's really no way we do that in, in the database except they would be grayed out in that circumstance. And you would talk to your, um, your database administrator or your administrator that was in your contract would be the, the clearest way to answer that. If you can do it, it, it it'll work. If it, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't let you do it, then you need to either do a, a support request to change the uh, resources that are available in your tenancy, or you need to talk to your administrator to see if they've restricted through quotas the number, the number and types of systems that can be deployed in that particular compartment or tenancy. <clears throat> and then to build off of that too, I don't know if it's directly related, but there's also, if you're trying to look at what's already been deployed within your tenancy, you have the tenancy, and tenancy explorer tool as well. So if you wanna look across like what resources do I have provisioned within my tenancy and then filter by type or status, you can, you can do that as well. And yeah, just to show real quick what Joey's talking about. So in the hamburger menu, um, Tenancy Explorer is gonna be under governance and admin and you'll see Tenancy Management and you'll see Tenancy Explorer. So this might take a little while to load, but you can kind of see everything that's been created. Um, and you can uh, filter that by your compartments, whether that's your root compartment or these individual um, sub compartments here. Thank you, Olivia. And then, there's one more unanswered question in Q&A, and it looks like it says Anand's going to answer this question live. So I don't know, Anand, if you want to do that or just plop some documentation into the chat. No, I, I did the, I, I did pop the documentation in the chat. Uh, I think it's about patching. I think uh, Oracle patches are usually cumulative, but I think um, Renu is having an issue with um, our, our patching and from the OCI console is 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 causing some issues. I, I encourage her to contact Oracle support because that will really provide her um, what's happening from her environment perspective. Um, usually Oracle patches are all cumulative. You don't have to apply the, the minor patches when you have a major patch released. Got it. Thank you, Nan. All right. And just to put this, we like to put this up at the end of our presentations here. You can always register for these webinars, our day one and beyond series. We'll be covering more and more topics in a new series. We'll be I mean, one more session in this series. The new session will be going on at the beginning of next year in January. But we'd like to put this up as well. If you'd like to further your learning on your own, we always have OCI training and certification available. So a couple of links for you to access that there. Hands-on labs, Olivia showed within the console, that's through our live labs platform. So across a bunch of different services and use cases can walk you through uh, how to do some of those. There's the OCI core lab, which is one of those labs within live labs, as well as some autonomous database ones. So you can kind of follow along with some of the things that uh, Olivia was doing in the console today with autonomous database, and then a bunch of videos within Oracle Learning on YouTube. Awesome. Is there any other question that we want to spend more time on? Or if, audience, if you have any question, you can quickly put it in Q&A and we can answer the question live. Since we have some time today, we can make use of that. Yeah, let's see if there's any in here that we can answer quickly. Um... If not, uh, I don't see anything new coming up. What about the four questions? So Sunil and Anand is happily, they're happily typing away the answers. Joe, you want to take any of the questions? Yes, yeah, so there's the one question on if you're currently an Oracle Cloud ERP or HCM customer, can I link the autonomous database to our cloud? database. So allowing the ability to pull data from both databases and or trigger data from the cloud ERP and ADP systems. 
So yes, as um, you can. So if you're utilizing autonomous database system, you can have that integrate and pull data from your ERP and HT, HCM systems to be used. So that can be possible. A um, couple different ways you could do that as well. Uh, And then how does auto scaling impact the license and cost relating to CPU or storage? So with your OCI subscription, you usually will have what's called universal cloud credits. So you'd be licensed for a certain number of credits within OCI or a certain amount and your CPU or storage cost will pull from the universal cloud credits a lot of the time. Um, in terms of auto scaling, so if you're using additional CPU or storage, typically the cost associated with those additional resources uh, will be shown and pulled from those UCCs as well. I don't know if there, there might be some nuances there for specific services if Sunil or Lynn wants to add some of those, but generally that's the case. No, there's no issue with that. The you're not limited with auto scaling to any particular license. If you're in OCI, you're you get charged for what you use, and when you when you're not using, you don't get charged. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And one of them is how is data guard priced? It's essentially a second instance cost added. Um, we do have a cost estimator and pricing page. So if you're curious about pricing for any of the services, we can just plop that into the chat here too. So you can see for each service, what's the general rate for it? Um, so let me see if I can find that real quick. While I'm searching, if anyone else has some answers to the last questions, feel free. Yeah, there's some new questions that came up. Um, is RSC included in autonomous database? Sunil Lin. So yeah, since autonomous is built on top of a exadata to node cluster, you will have a, you'll have rack by default if you've put it on a two-node cluster. Sunil, there is one more question by Blesselda about granting um, roles. Yeah, yeah, I'm taking a look for that. Um, I, I know what he's uh, saying with the, um, or here she is saying with the granted roles tab, and I'm trying to see if there is a, a list or like a compendium of what all of those things are granting. Because there's a ton of roles in, in that tab. Okay. Olivia, uh, Joey, can you share that last screen where we have our email address if they want to reach out to us for questions? I don't think I... Or maybe we can, or maybe we can just put the email address in the chat window. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that one. I guess um, if you have questions, you can email it to the address that Joey will be putting in the chat um, in a moment. But this was this was a great session. Thank you so much, Olivia, Joey, Sunil, Lynn. Um, I don't think we would have done answered all the questions without the help of Sunil and Lynn. So thanks, guys, and Anand as well. Really appreciate your time and help. Um, and a big thanks to everyone for joining us today. Our next session will be the last in this series. Uh, it'll be on Oracle Cloud Platform after two weeks on Tuesday, December 13th. Um, I have posted the uh, link for day one and beyond. You can use the same page to register for that last session and you'll find information on the 2023 series on the same page as well. The link will remain the same, um, hopefully. Uh, and you'll receive an email with the recording of this session. Um, you can use that to revise whatever you learned today or share it with others who might have missed the session. So thanks again for your time today. We'll see you all next time. Have a great day, everyone.